Well, dang, I got quite a remarkable guest today. Some of you heard me speak about Larry Williams in the past, but he's a gentleman that um, not only does he have a lot of insight and tools to get him ahead, uh, he's probably, if not the most humble, one of the, one of the most humble um, people in this in this business I've talked to about his newsletter. And uh, sometimes I read his newsletter and uh, it's contrarian to everything else I'm reading. So it's um, really caused me to sit and think a bit. His name is Larry Williams. He's a best-selling author. He's on Amazon. Uh, featured on most media shows you can find. Um, he's a frequent contributor to Jim Cramer's show on CNN. Uh, thought, thought thousands of people how to trade. Uh, but check this out. He's ran twice for the U.S. Senate. He's run 76 marathons. That's a lot. Um, and publishes the most valuable news newsletter that I buy for JCN. Well, Larry, good morning. How you doing? Good morning. I'm doing great. It's like it's nice to be here. This is really thrilling to be invited for an old man to talk about the market. So I, I'm like looking forward to this. Well, I think our clients are really get insights that they don't normally get. And uh, I'll start right, right off with one that I think is most intriguing because um, we talk to our clients a lot about technical data and how we can analyze what the market's doing and base our decision on that. But let me ask you a question. You hear people say you can't time the market. If somebody would say, Larry, you can't time the market, what would be your reply to that? Well, most people can't time the market. I agree. Most technical analysis really doesn't work in timing the market, but there have been people that have successfully timed the market. Uh, look at the, some of the great traders I know I'm personal friends with. They've timed the market and they've made billions of dollars. Uh, so yeah, it's, sure, it's possible, but can everybody do it? No, a lot of people I think are in the wrong direction, but uh, through history, we have seen people that have timed the market can you do every little uptick in the market? No, of course not. We can get the broad spectrum of the general trend we're going to be in bull market, bear market, when we're going to have tops and bottoms. Absolutely, we can time the market. What kind of tools do you use to time the market? Well, um, the thing that I've really gotten into the, the last maybe six years now is cycles, which is where I really started way back when I started trading in 1962. I noticed a four-year cycle back then, about every four years, we had stock market lows, 62, 66, 70, 74, 78, we had stock market lows. I go, wow, there's something going on here. But it was really hard to do that mathematically, and now, thanks to computers and math, we can. So I think that the market is uh, almost predestined to do what it's going to do in terms of the overall move, the erratic fluctuations of day-to-day. Uh, that's different, but it 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 appears to me it's on a path, and we can get a pretty good idea in advance what that path's going to be. Yeah, I saw that in your newsletter. You you had uh, said you predicted this ten years ago from charts. So I showed you ten years ago this is going to happen. I just find that immensely intriguing. Uh, where would you find these cycles? How would the average consumer they want to read what these cycles you mentioned? How would they find that data? Well, you look at your charts and drink a glass of wine and you might see it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, you, you know, that's, uh, I think, the unique uh, advantage I have. This is all that I do. Uh, I trade and I research and I look at the markets and I have access to, you know, great friends that have run billions of dollars in the market. So we exchange ideas and, and I'm kind of their research guy to like, well, how about this idea? So we'll look like something's going on right now. is so really interesting. And that's, again, the Fed didn't lower interest rates when people thought they would, right? What, what I found in my research is clearly the Fed doesn't look at inflation to raise or lower interest rates, to lower interest rates. They look at uh, employment. And mm -hmm. employment numbers still haven't got to the point where they're going to lower rates. So while the, the mem in the media is, oh, it's all about inflation's come down. Why didn't they lower rates? The market sells off. That's not what they're looking at. So I'm trying to look in these things, the relationships of, say, employment, inflation, interest rates, stock prices. And that gives me the fundamental view to say, yeah, cycles are bullish now, and the fundamental view is there, then they go together. I think you need both fundamentals and technicals. Um, uh, they, they really go hand in hand because things happen for reasons. Fundamentals drive the market. But they don't say it's going to happen now. That's where technical stuff comes in and says, yeah, now you have a buy or sell and you expect the fundamental condition to now kick in and cause prices to go up or down. Yeah, and the, and the most recent news that you talked about this year and that I think you said that um, 
uh, in February, we're going to see the market dip down a bit and then start running back up in March. And it was kind of interesting because you had four different times this year where you showed you thought the market was going to pull back and go back in. That's Is that your fundamental analysis? Or your that's that's the cyclical analysis. That's the cycle to the marketplace. And, you know, I, I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong in the future. That's why money management is also critical in this business. You can't bet the house on every single swing you see in the marketplace. But generally speaking, for quite a few years, we've been able to get in alignment with the major highs and lows or when the rallies are going to start. Well, to the day, occasionally that's just luck, though. But generally speaking, yeah, I expect we're going to see weakness into March. And uh, that looks like that started now. And uh, suddenly people are saying, oh, we might be right again. Uh, <laughs> but you know what's going to happen? You and I know what's going to happen come March, April. The market will be, in my mind, at least will be selling off. People, oh, we're in a bear market. Oh, this is horrible. Oh, what are we going to do? And that's going to make another market bottom. Just a <laughs> cycle say. You know, one of the most uh, poignant things I saw in your newsletter, because I, I find that um, I, I service about 500 households. And so it's really important to me to educate my clientele. And the reason being is that um, the more they know, the better I'm going to be able to serve them, the better they're going to feel. And something I know is a horrible no-no uh, that you really enforced that was when you said, um, you're always asked about being forecast due to wars, news, talking heads, and TV, et cetera. And you say, no, current action does not change the research going back over 100 years of price information. The path was set a long time ago. Yeah, that's such a conflicting view. A lot of people think that news drive the market, and I think news drive the market on an uh, intraday basis, maybe. But in terms of the path that we've been on, there was a book written way back in the 1930s um, by Edgar Lawrence Smith that talked about a, about a 42-month cycle. That called the market low in, uh, last year in 2022. That called the market low in uh, 2008. It's been around a long time. So, uh, and you have to adapt that as we get more data, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, the big takeaway, especially for those households you talk about, I think is don't get frightened out of this business. Uh, one of my dear friends, Vic Niederhoff, really taught me to don't be bearish very often or for very long. You look back the the horrible market of 2008, right? What did that last? About 12 months. So if you can't sit through the market for 12 months, you probably shouldn't be in stocks. The, the pandemic crash, that lasted, what, three months before the thing turned around, four months maybe before it turned around. The crash of 1966, the uh, crash of 1962, my first crash, that was down, what, about six months. So if you can't sit through some time and some decline, you probably aren't really cut out to be a long-term investor. The, the trend is up. And it, there's an upward drift in this marketplace, and people just get scared by the the Cassandras, the purveyors of pessimism, uh, they're always there, and you have to be really careful of them. Yeah, I think fear is a horrible motivator, probably in, in almost in all your life, fear is a bad motivator. No, but it's a great motivator. If we want to sell our forecast report, we, we say there's a bear market coming, everybody will buy it. <laughs> yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a bull hard. market coming, bull market, nobody wants to buy it. It's like really funny. My son's a psychiatrist, as you probably know, and he talked about research he did with just successful traders. He researched just really successful traders, guys that manage hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. And he found that they're all pretty optimistic, that they they don't have a cognitive bearish bias. And a psychi psychiatric proc uh, practice, Jason said, Dad, everybody has a bearish bias. They love bad news. They like to see their brother-in-laws losing money because they feel good. And my background is in journalism. And what I learned is that if it bleeds, it leads. You want bad news. That's the story of the day. You don't write about good news. And and we're, we're attracted to bad news. We're attracted to bearishness. I, I, want, I have a friend who was on TV a while ago, uh, on, on one of the major uh, TV financial shows. He's very bearish. He'd been on a couple of times. So I wrote, and I know the guy as well, this, the, the, um, the talking head, said, hey, why don't you get a bull on? You know, how about equal time? never heard back because I, I think they really like to have bears on and that's that cognitive bearish bias you have to be careful of all this bearishness that that's permeates in the media but it tracks attention it gets viewers but it, it gets you out of the wrong side of the market and, and tremendously bad for an unsophisticated investor because they're watching news all day seeing all those bad news and they call me and say john what are we going to do and you say we're going to sit tight that 
this right. is a comfortable feeling when everything they're telling them is is horrible. I think it's you know another thing you you well know is true is that when the the people are the most bearish, it's typically the best time to be in the market. Oh, clearly, what, what we call the major stock market low in, the low in, in 2008, the low in 2012, the low in 2020, the low in 2022 is what I call my panic indicator. That's a measure of extreme panic in the marketplace. They call the 1962 low, the 66 low. When people get extreme in their panic, it's just, it's just tossing it up. You got to step in and buy. And, and that's why we have to reverse what's bad for everybody is good for me. What's good for everybody is like, I'm, I'm very cautious when everything that's really good. But when things are just horrible and people are crying about their stock portfolio, go, okay, time for Williams to get back in here. It, 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 in our world, it's so different. It's what's good is bad. And what's bad is really good. And I really feel more and more as I have to do a better job of teaching my clientele this because if they, if they can see it the way that I do and that you do, that this bad news really is good news for us because people are going to be selling their socks, dumping them out, and we're going to buy Amazon at a better price today than we had bought it a month ago or a year ago. Yeah, and I like to show people a long-term chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average going back to 1700. And it's it's like this. There's some blips along the way, but it's like that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're, why has Warren Buffett been so incredibly successful? Because he holds on to stock. Yeah. He well, doesn't get scared. I, I picked up also in your newsletter that I think it's quite remarkable. Most financial uh, folks are going to refer to the S&P 500. And you said, you look at Luke, the Dow Jones because uh, they run about the same, but the Dow is 30 stocks. So you, you have to you have to examine 30 stocks versus 500. Talk a bit about that. Well, an easy way to beat the market when you think about it, just like reverse thinking here, is instead of trying to find the hot stocks in the Dow and just buy those, buy the stocks that are the losers in the Dow and buy the rest of them and you'll beat the Dow. If you can find a couple stocks will underperform the Dow and buy the rest of them, you beat the averages. Uh, everybody wants to find the winner, but the winners crash. I'm so, so many the, stocks is horrible. Loser, how long a period of time would you look at the, the Dow to determine what the losers are? Would that be a day? Well, I'd, look at, I'd look fundamentally what the losers are. What's their price sales ratio? What's their PE ratios? We know stocks with real high PE ratios tend to do poorly in the future. The price sales ratios, they tend to do poorly in the future. So with that in mind, um, I, I'm careful. Of, I want to buy stock with low PEs and low price sales they have a better chance of not going down on a precipitous fashion. Yeah, I really like that notion of um, instead of just finding for the, the, the leader, find the ones that are lagging, buy those, and then buy, reinvest and down, you're, you're ahead of the game. Well, yeah, it's really an old, I think it's biblical, the, the, or Bob Dylan, the first one now shall later be last. And that's kind of true in the stock market. I mean, you've seen these stock cycle. Right now, AI has been a really big thing. It probably means it's going to come down for a while. So you have to be careful about buying the, the thing of the day. That's why one of my favorite songs, John Denver sang, I think John Prine wrote it, and the line is, blow up your TV, eat a lot of peaches, you got to find Jesus on your own. <laughs> it's like, I have, we don't have a television set. Really? I don't, yeah, I, I don't watch I don't watch television because all my liberal friends watch it and they're really angry. All my conservative friends watch TV and they're really angry. I go, why well, do I want to be angry, right? They're both upset and, and they're following, they're chasing the tail on the donkey in a blindfolded room. And, and so I go, yeah, yeah I'm going to follow my charts and my stuff. I'm going to be wrong. I know that. So I never bet real big. I, I Nobody's perfect in this business. You look, the great traders, the great funds, the Renaissance, whoever, they, they're not straight path to heaven that's part of the business but it's a lot easier to have less data coming in than every five seconds some data coming in the marketplace yeah i really i got that that you, you know your, your time trading you don't spend as many hours as uh, a lot of folks that i know you 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 drill down to a few things and you're gonna follow those things on, on your on your time frame yeah you know years ago when i run when the robins woke up trading championship i took $10,000 to $1.1 million real trading in a year. I was very focused on a very short term. It was a, a miserable year in my life. That's all I did was trade. And it's not, a, it's not a good lifestyle. And especially now, almost 82 years of age, like I don't need another trade. I want a winning trade. And I think that's true of your people. They're not traders. 
no. they're they're investing for a longer term view. The, the really interesting thing is most people don't fully understand what's good performance. If you can do 10, 12 percent a year, you're knocking out of the park in this business. The the exceptional people will do 20 to 30 percent a year. And usually they're not consistent at that. Most people have an unrealistic expectation of what performance will be. Yeah, I agree with you. Talk a moment, and so you talk about the decennial pattern and the natural cycle. Give me some some information on those two. Well, the decennial pattern is what Edgar Lawrence Smith wrote about way back in the 1930s. Uh, Warren Buffett loved his approach to the market, especially he did a lot of fundamental basis uh, reports on back then in the 1930s. Everybody thought that bonds always beat stocks. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, some research came out about a month ago that says that bonds do beat stock, but we've really torn into the research and there's some data, survival data with it. But anyway, so so Edgar Lawrence Smith was not just you know, a little chartist guy, a W.D. Gann chart man or something. This is a, a you know, accredited professor. And he pointed out there's a cycle of about 10 years that the market acts in a certain way because of the 11 year solar cycle perhaps nobody knows for sure what causes this i've tried to find out and i'm not smart enough to do it can't even come close to it but typically years that end in two will all trade about the same way so 1962 was a bottom in the market 1972 1982 were bottoms of the market 1992 was the bottom in the market uh, 2022 was the bottom on the market. Isn't that interesting? It's very interesting. Yeah, that there there is something going on here. Um, years ending in eights and nines don't tend to do really well, like 1929, 1939, 1969, sorry, the 1970 huge bear market. So there seems to be a general pattern uh, that years within the decade are comparable or similar. Not always, but it's a pretty good guideline to just follow those years. So we're in a year ending now in four. So 2024 should be about like 2004, 2014, uh, 1994, 1984, 1974, 1964. You can go back and look at those years, average them, get a pretty good idea about what's going to happen this year. That's quite remarkable. I'd like, I'd like to wrap this up with your uh, your, your forecast for this, this election year. What do you think this is going to play, this is going to play out for the market? Well, I think the guy with most votes is going to win. Uh, how they're counted, I don't know. <laughs> but it doesn't matter to me. Uh, again, because I have that little different view of the marketplace. I know this. If you look at the data, because I'm a data-driven guy, right? Stocks rally right at election time. You want to get long stocks a couple of days before the election, hold them three or four or five days after the election. It doesn't matter which dirty dog we elect, Marcus rally at election time. So, uh, you know, to me, like, hey, they've got a great trade coming up this year. Uh, it, who wins? Uh, I don't know. You know, we're heavily involved in politics. Spent a lot of time with President Reagan, a phenomenal man. Um, I kind of backed out of politics now. And I'm a trader. I'm just data driven. I, it doesn't matter what happens at election time. If your guy loses, your guy wins. It doesn't matter. You want to go long stocks right around the day two or before election. And then we have a strong rally right after the election. So get ready for that. When Trump uh, won the first time, when Trump won his election, I had a client that uh, leading up to it was very nervous about the election. And I kept trying to share with him why I wasn't nervous and basically what you're sharing now but then he insisted that I just pull him out of the market, like in, in I think, in August or September. And, of course, Trump won. The market went up just superfluously. You know? and, and I met with him afterwards. And I said, you know, you, you saw we lost here. It's time to be invested again. And he dilly out on another four to six months before we got in. All that fear and lack of knowledge caused him to make some really bad decisions. So what I'm hoping our clientele understand is that there are things we can control. There's some things we can't control. And we're going to focus on those things we can control. And we're going to have patience as we invest because it, success with investing and impatience are not a good combination. Well, I would ask him a question. Look back at all the presidents, with maybe the exception of Jimmy Carter. Has it ever really made a difference to the stock market who the president was? Has it really made any difference in your life who the president was? Any major substantial difference? 
No, the economy moves along, it goes up, it goes down. That seems to be the natural the rule of life and life's not a perfect game things go up and down in the markets i do think and this is the point so many people miss the federal reserve yeah i know it's a private corporation i read all that stuff about them the federal reserve started to get very powerful about 1950 and from 1950 forward the data of how they operate in the market has changed and they have done one heck of a good job have we had another 1933, another 1929, another 1914? No. So people, um, I used to be, when I ran for the U.S. Senate Montana, I was really anti-Fed guy, well, big time. And now I go, you know what? They've done a damn good job regulating their congressional mandate is employment, then inflation, and a stable economy. And yeah, we've had bear markets. They haven't lasted very long. So no, they are rather short. Yeah, they really are. And time are and really well, price magnitude and emotions are not short in emotions. Yeah. You know, that gets us. But they, they, the future of America, Ronald Reagan always said, is still in front of us. And it is. And, and it, you know, I, my longer term view of 2026, something like that, I think I'm probably going to be a really big time bear based on what I see in the fundamental data. But between now and then, let the good times roll. In 2026, do you see a successive years of a bear market, or will it be your your typical bear market variety? Well, there seems to be a pattern that we have a big explosive up move. Then we go sideways for six or seven years. Starting in 1966, we went sideways for six or seven years. You'll see that pattern repeat itself. And I think that's what where we'll be about then, that we're going to be Right now, you just buy and hold on. But in the market I grew up on, the 1960s, the market went up and down, up and down, and it finally took off. So you sold the big rallies, bought the big breaks. And people who learned that got killed when the market went straight up because they sold the big rallies and they went higher and higher and they had to cover their shorts. So I think we're going to enter this sideways move starting about 2026. And again, a little conjecture on my part is we get closer. Hopefully, God willing, I'll still be here and we'll have a better view of that. But I that's my big concern, not now, but 2026. I think things then could get dicey. Well, I, I sure appreciate your generosity to share your information to our clients. I'll have uh, I've taken a couple of your courses, gonna take another one. I think you've got some uh, intellectual capital that I just can't find anywhere else. And I'm amazed you gave me your time today. So, oh, thank my, you. I'm a joy to do it. I, you know, just I think what you're doing is so great. You're educating people. You're not saying buy here, sell there. I know this. I have the be all. Once people know more about this, it's easier for them to make good decisions. Now that that's that's my thoughts. That's why I do it. So great. take care. Hope to see you real soon, and I'll be uh, be, be I'm sure be emailing you some questions from time to time. Look forward to that. Good luck and good trading. Thanks Thank so much you. for having me. Thank you. Thank you.